Welcome to the Attorney Post, your source for inside baseball talk about the legal field with the top attorneys in the country. Here's your host, Justin West. All right. Hey, guys, I think we're live. Hello and welcome again to the Attorney Post, where we are discussing what's going on in various facets of the law with lawyers at the top of their game. In this episode, we're going to be talking to Heather Abrigo. Uh, she's at the law firm of Fagre Drinker. Uh, and we're going to be learning what she does to help plan sponsors and service providers navigate the complexities of retirement plans, health plans, welfare plans, etc. Plus, we're going to really dig in at the end to her work uh, with KIND, which is the Kids in Need of Defense. Uh, it's a pro bono stuff that she does. And I'm really excited to hear about this. I got just a little teaser before the uh, the interview as to what she's doing. I know that's real her her real passion is so I'm really really excited to to see what she has to say about that. Obviously, as always, before we begin, we're going to jump over here and we're going to uh, have a quick word from our sponsor. This is actually the website for Fagre Drinker. They're not our sponsor, but I want you to know uh, obviously who uh, Heather works for. Uh, but our first sponsor today is of course again InjuryAttorneyLeads.com. Personal injury attorneys spend a lot of time and money advertising, but it's difficult to get qualified leads usually. Pay Paying for leads they're not qualified or worse you're getting leads from the internet that are no longer interested in talking to a lawyer so even if you ever get a hold of them they, they're done they don't want to talk to you you can spend between 99 dollars and 400 dollars on the low end uh just to get a hold of these people uh and usually go through five or ten of these leads before you get one prospective client on the phone the solution is injuryattorneyleads.com InjuryAttorneyLeads.com will live transfer people directly to your firm who have been in an automobile accident and who want to talk to a lawyer about their case. You can be sure that these potential clients meet your criteria for a qualified lead and the close rates average 60%. Uh, set up a time to speak with a client generation specialist by visiting InjuryAttorneyLeads.com today. That's again, scheduling a time at InjuryAttorneyLeads.com. All right. And I am joined again with Heather. Now, Heather, good to see you. Thank you for uh, being here with me today. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of a bio here, and then you're going to fill me in on the rest that I missed out on, because of course, there's just so much in everybody's life, right? Uh, Heather is a graduate, uh, I believe, of Southwestern University of School of Law. Um, she spent her first 14 years as an associate attorney with the uh, Raish and Riker uh, law firm before becoming a partner for nine years with Drinker, Biddle, and Reith. Uh, and then she maintained her partnership status when that firm merged with another firm, uh, Fogre Baker and Daniels, to become Fogre Drinker, where she now works, which is actually a top 50 law firm uh, designed around helping clients. She is the co-leader of the firm's financial services industry group. Uh, she assists plan sponsors and service providers in navigating the complexities of uh, qualified and non-qualified uh, retirement plans, as well as health and welfare plans. Uh, she works works with plan sponsors that are publicly traded and the issues surrounding employer securities and retirement plans. Uh, and while her work extends to all aspects of employee benefits, she's particularly experienced in assisting plan committees and sponsors in fulfilling their fiduciary duties. She advises on a variety of fiduciary compliance issues and assists with the defense of government AG agency audits and investigations, including but not limited to, of course, the Department of Labor, the IRS, and the Centers for Medicare and uh, Medicaid Services, CMS. Uh, Heather also works with Kids in, Needs, uh, Kids in Need of Defense, K-I-N-D, KIND. Uh, she provides pro bono representation for unaccompanied children who enter the United States and who have been persecuted in their home countries, trafficked to the United States, and abused, abandoned, or neglected in family court and immigration court. And that's something that I can't wait to get into. I know that there's a lot of this stuff in the news today as well, but we're going to start with the more perfunctory questions, then we'll get there. So Heather, the first question is, always is what did I miss oh my gosh I mean um I I miss sleeping in to be honest <laughs> <laughs> all of that on my bio I miss sleeping in no I think I think that just about covers it um you know I definitely enjoy helping you know the big plan sponsors and retirement plans and really the focus is you know how do we get our employees to a place where you know they're actually taken care of I'm at retirement. So that's kind of the good feel as to why I do what I do. Um, and then, like you said, you know, with kind, that is definitely a passion of mine. Um, I am bilingual. So it's something that I very much enjoy um, being able to help and, you know, really give, you know, access to the courts to folks that would otherwise, you know, never be able to um, take advantage of, of some of the services out there. So, so I don't think you missed anything. I think that about covered it. 
<laughs> oh, I did my research. Okay. <laughs> All righty. Well, so here's a question I'm going to start off with. Um, I actually have a lot of people ask me this question because I deal with attorneys all the time. Again, I'm a network. I'm a, I'm a network marketer. I'm not a network marketer. I'm a marketer by trade. I network with a lot of attorneys. Um, and people always ask me, what's the difference between different kinds of attorneys? So you've kind of worked with, uh, you know, medium sized firms. Now you're with a much larger firm. So what is it like working for Fogre Drinker, which has, I think, over 1300 attorneys in uh, multiple locations around the world? How does that compare with, uh, you know, how you first got into law? You know, um, so when I first got into law, it's actually kind of an interesting story. I was 20 years old. I knew that I wanted to be a lawyer, um, but I just didn't know how to get into it. And so I started with like a temp agency and they had me running for coffee. And I said, you know, that's, that's, that's not something I think I'm going to enjoy. <laughs> I need more. <laughs> um, so at the time, the, um, the legal barista. Right. You know, that was going to be my specialty. So uh, Lisa Marcus, who was the HR at uh, Rich and Riker, you know, saw some potential and said, well, why don't you come over and be a file clerk? So I started at 20 years old with Rich and Riker in their file room. And I then became a corporate paralegal. And I then moved up to be a law clerk. I was in law school. And then um, when I graduated law school, uh, Fred Rich, you know, invited me to come join their practice group in ERISA. And so that's what that, we were a small boutique firm. Um, that's what the firm was really known for. And it was a great environment. You know, there was only a few of us within the group. You know, maybe there was six lawyers at the time doing ERISA. Um, and it was very home, you know, it was home-like. We were a family. It was very easy to get things done. You didn't have to go through all these kinds of checks and balances and as we merged into Drinker Biddle, things changed a little bit, obviously. It became a little bit more corporate. But I think the one thing that never changed, which is why I've been there for so long, is that we stayed a family. I still, to this day, work with Fred and Bruce and all of us that came over, but also kind of the mentality and that family vibe never changed, even when we became Fagery. Um, Baker, I think, you know... Um, Tom and Andy Kasner, who are, our, you know, the leads um, at the firm. And, 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 you know, they really, we all have the same mindset. We all really care about what we do, but we also care about ourselves as humans um, and people. And so that never changed. And I'm very thankful that I was able to keep that, um, that ability to, you know, do what I want when I kind of want and how I want. But also at the same time, we help each other out. Now, I'm not going to pretend like it's all, you know, roses and, you know, you know, there are definitely, you know, when you want to get clients, there's a much different process. You have to go through, you know, all these conflict checks. And a lot of times that'll prohibit some clients. I mean, we're very lucky. And what we do is that rarely there's a lot of conflicts just because we're so unique in what we do in the employee mm -hmm. benefits world. Um but, you know, there's definitely going to be a lot more of the, you know, you can't just run down somebody's office and be like, hey, I want to bring someone or I want to waive this, you know, retainer or so-and-so wants a discount. Like that doesn't yeah. happen anymore. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you go through a three-week process to get that done. But at the end day, we all kind of do have the same goals in place. So, so that is really helpful in giving what. Gotcha. So what does the, uh, and I might be getting a little bit of feedback here. Um, there we go. It resolved itself. What is the what is what does the process of getting a new client even look like for you? I mean, again, I know with you know, your average lower level or uh, smaller firm, you know, it's a uh, get found in Google or you know calling up people or you know someone who knows someone. But I think as you get bigger, the 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 game changes a little bit in how people find you. So how do people find you? How do you get your clients? Um, you know, so I'm very very lucky again in that what I do is very specialized, and there's not a whole lot of folks that do you know, specialize in ERISA and, you know, the internal revenue code as they relate to, you know, plans and, and this kind of arena. So um, a lot of the business that I get, you know, when we were a smaller firm and it was, we were a boutique firm, everybody knew the firm for what we did. So it was easier that people would find us and know, okay, that's the firm that does, you know, the ERISA stuff. Um, and then when we merged into a bigger firm, you know, we just really had to make sure that we were getting out there, that we were speaking, that we were writing articles, that folks really knew that we were still doing this kind of unique work. Um, and we were really keeping on top of all the differences, you know, the law changes, the regulation changes. I mean, it, in this area, it changes all the time. I mean, just with the SECURE Act, you know, and now the rescue, I mean, it just, 
evolves and you always, even though you think you know the answer, you have got to be on top of it and you have to show everybody how you're on top of it. You know, you have to have relevant articles that are present. So being in a bigger firm, um, I think just makes you push harder, but then you have more resources. You have other practice groups that you can cross collaborate with you know, on areas that you might not have been able to do when you were a boutique firm. So it's really, you know, and my clients, a lot of them come to me from referral sources. So third party administrators, um, you know, um, record keepers, the folks that actually work on the plan might find a problem and be like, oh, okay, this is, you know, you need somebody in ERISA to, to deal with this. And, you know, that fortunately for me, that list isn't so long. So hopefully, usually I'm, I'm on that list somewhere. Gotcha. So here's an odd question, maybe, uh, and I don't mean this to sound negative, uh, but it'll may come across this way. The uh, there are certain facets of the law that are kind of sexy, right? When you think of like your 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 TV shows, your cop dramas, et cetera, the the defense lawyers, the criminal investigations, you know, even even personal injury when you're dealing with like collisions and all sorts of stuff, right? But I feel like ERISA law is kind of boring, and I know that from an outside perspective, for a lot of people, like what even is ERISA law, and so I guess one of my questions is, how fascinating do you find it on the inside? And what's something you can tell people that would really actually get their brains kind of thinking about this in a way that finds it more fascinating? Does that make sense? No, it's, it's um, yeah, no, I don't think sexy and Arissa was ever said in the same <laughs> sentence. I can guarantee you that. We did um, it. We did it. We're the first. <laughs> That's never happened. Um so Groundbreaking I, podcasting from the attorney right. post. You heard it first here, folks. Only known. Check out the TikToks of Arissa. <laughs> and <laughs> but in all in all seriousness, I have a lot of times that problem because you know when we have first years coming in and they have to interview with all the different practice groups. Like, what is this Arissa thing that you speak of? Mm -hmm. You know, and why would I want to do it? And the only selling point is kind of funny. I mean, it is challenging. I am the type of person where I need to have something that is constantly changing, that is constantly challenging me. And ERISA, which is definitely, you know, it was passed in 1974. It's the Employees Retirement Income Security Act. And it basically makes you jump around, to be perfectly honest, between the Internal Revenue Code and different titles of the Internal Revenue Code and figuring out what applies, how does it apply. And you're dealing with millions and millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. But nobody cares about that. I mean, that's kind of sexy. Like yeah. the, the money part is sexy, if anything. But this is what I tell the first years. Look, I know you think litigation is amazing. You want to, you know, you want to be on the law and orders. You want to be on the suits. You want to be in front of the judge. You want to be able to, you know, cause that rise. But you're going to be working, you know, 15 hour days, seven days a week. And, you know, it's going to be brutal. I get to go home. <laughs> I, I, I bill my hours. I rarely have deadlines. Um, I mean, I have to be on it, you know, and I have a lot of marketing things that I have to do. And, but it is not the kind of lifestyle that litigation, you know, allows for. Um, so that's kind of the things that I tease some, you know, the junior associates and first years, which is, you may not understand a single thing that I do, but I can guarantee you that it, you know, you'll be able to go home and have dinner with your family and you most likely will have most of your weekends off and you'll have enough work that you won't have to worry about your billables. Be smart, you know, you know, don't, don't ever take it for granted because it's very easy when you get into this field that, oh, I don't have deadlines. You know, I don't have to keep up with this. Nobody, you've got to keep up with it, but you can have a life. And that was something that, you know, when I, I graduated law school, I think I was about, I gave birth two weeks after my final exam. Puzzle tough. <laughs> yeah, thank you. But, but my priority was I wanted to have a family and I wanted to make sure that my daughter was a priority in my life. And this career allowed me to do that and have that lifestyle and be able to be there for my, for my child. So that's awesome. That, that's kind of why I chose and why I love what I do, because I do have that flexibility, um, you know, and you know, it's every once in a while, you know, when you're appearing before maybe the Department of Labor, I've had a, cap, a couple of tax court cases. Um, it does get like, there, you know, you just got to find what it is in it that will make it interesting for you. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. So what's one of the most complex issues you've had to work on uh, maybe in recent memory and, and what approach did you bring to that? Um, I definitely think that mergers and acquisitions are something that is very 
it could be very complicated. And I have a psych undergrad and I definitely find that that psychologist in me comes out. Um, and the reason for that is because, you know, like I said, you're dealing with millions and millions of dollars. And sometimes, I mean, I have a couple of plants that have billions of dollars in them, right? So you're dealing with in a merger and acquisition, one company wanting to buy another company. And everybody, all the corporate M&A lawyers are focused on the transaction in and of itself. How much are we paying? What are the liabilities? Prove it to us. So they're dealing with all that stuff. But everybody forgets about the benefit plans. And so maybe a week before closing, somebody's like, oh, well, wait, if we're going to have all these employees transfer over, what does that mean? Can they take their retirement plan? Can they take a distribution? Do we have, you know, so there's all these factors. And then what if the company that's being sold has like major problems with their 401k plan? What mm. if there's money missing, you know, in a stock sale, that liability sometimes can transfer over to the buyer, but the buyer never even thought of that. Um, so we will get called in at the last minute and, you know, bless the plan or tell us everything that has to happen. And then, you know, there have been cases where we have to tell them, hold on, because just, I think it was two weeks ago, there was an understanding in a in an M&A case that the employees could take a distribution. They could take their money out. And I was like, no, 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 no. You know, that's not. And so we had to basically, you know, delay the close date, you know, and, and, and there's some real ramifications if you do that tax ramifications and um, mm. some severe problems, if, you know, you don't understand what to do with the employee benefits and now COBRA obligations, um, are coming into play, who's going to cover the COBRA obligations that can get very, very expensive. Um, you know, there's something called a partial plan termination. So sometimes when you're just taking a division and terminating that division and selling out that division, that sometimes means you have to hundred percent vest all those people. That's a lot of money right there. So there's a lot of issues that have to, you know, come into play. And when we're coming in at the last, you know, week, and everybody wants to sign and all the money, you know, is on the table and this is what it is. It is not an easy feat to be able to say to them, well, you know, <laughs> it's not going to happen the way you wanted it to happen because you have all these problems. And so it's just, um, you know, and you're kind of, you're bringing up these problems and then now you're going to get the brunt of it because, well, these are ridiculous. I mean, come on, this is, these are benefit plans. Like how much trouble could they be? Oh, they could be a lot. I can guarantee you. They could be a lot. <laughs> so so that's kind of the, you just have to navigate all the different, not just personalities, but, you know, areas of law that you're dealing with and figure out really some, you know, solutions to complex problems. So. Gotcha. So one of the questions I like to ask people, um, and this works really well for litigators is, you know, tell me about a, a big win or a big loss um, and what it taught you, you know, how, how you approach it, et cetera. Now in, in your particular field, I feel like there's, there's fewer spaces for what we would consider a big loss or a big win, but was there, was there a time that you pulled something out of your hat at the last minute that worked amazingly or like realized after the fact that you or somehow, somehow something got biffed in a really bad way and, and what the fallout was from that. Does that make sense? No, absolutely. And I think, um, I'm going to talk about something that I think was a big win, but a big loss at the same time. And the only reason for that is because, you know, we can get very complacent in what we do. Especially when you're dealing with the tax and documents and things like that, you kind of get a little bit, I'm not going to say lazy, but I'm going to say lazy. Um, and at the time I had an associate helping me out and especially we're, we're dealing with plan documents. So we're dealing with, you know, 68, 75 pages of just boilerplate language and maybe five pages of those documents actually mean something, mm -hmm. but you have to know where to look to find out what means. So, um, and this happened many, many years ago, but it was a huge lesson to me. Um, and so I had had an associate helping me and a client had asked a simple question. And so I said, oh, you know, go look for me in the document. I thought, it, you know, simple answer and see if the answer is there. So he looked, gave an answer to the client. And unfortunately the answer was wrong mm. because what he had done was a controlled find, looked for this word, the word wasn't there. So he assumed that the document didn't address it and, but he didn't bother to read the document. Mm. So the client came back to me and I'm the one that's, you know, the partner is the one that's responsible. It doesn't matter who you have doing anything for you. It is your responsibility yeah. regardless of who you assign it to, to get the right answer to the client. 
So I had shot the answer to the client, you know, not really the, that, you know, what went under it. And she came back to me and she said, well, wait a minute, what does this mean? And she gives me a provision in the plan that gave us the answer. And we almost got fired. Mm. And I had to scramble. I had to meet with the client. I had to definitely eat crow, which was, and it was, you could have heard the screaming words <laughs> and the door slamming from probably three blocks away. Um, <laughs> but what it taught me is I take everything personally. I am very, when I, when I have a client, their plan becomes our plan. And my mistake becomes 10 times because I know that they're paying me not to make a mistake. Yeah. And that's what I'm You're the expert. For. And, and that was something that I learned because we, I ended up getting that client back because I had a great relationship with them. And I basically told them exactly what happened. And I took respons a hundred percent responsibility, but what it taught me though. And I will always remember that feeling to this day, never take your job for granted. Mm. Never allow anybody else to do all the work for you always double check no matter what associate you have doing the work for you never assume that it's correct you always have to be on top of it you always have to just double check it unfortunately you know i i take that personal responsibility because i know i'm the one answering to the client um and you know a mistake like that you wouldn't think that it would be so important but a mistake like that could cost millions of dollars yeah. and so the trust that the clients have in me to not make that kind of mistake is where I put all my effort. So that's what I mean when I say, you gotta be on top of it. You can't just do a control find. You ha you may have read that document 10 times, but you didn't read that document for that one specific purpose. Read yeah. it again, you know, go back to the regs, read the regs, read the preambles to the regs. Um, you just can never get lazy. You can never assume or take for granted um, what you're doing in this arena, because like you said, it's not sexy, it is boring, but you have to realize the importance of what you're telling your clients and what it means to them and what could happen um, if you aren't giving. So it was a huge loss that day, but it affected me to this very day. That was like 15 years ago. And I have that client still to this day. That's awesome. Um, so I think that I learned a huge lesson that day. Thank God, you know, yeah. I, I, I so appreciate that it happened and I can guarantee you that I never send anything to a client anymore um, or ever again after that day without knowing for sure that that is the best answer and that is the answer that needs to be given. That's a good answer. And that's, that's a good lesson in general. And I think that's applicable definitely even outside of what you do. I mean, I think about all the things I do on a daily basis and I've got a few people that do work for me and write for me and stuff like that here and there. And, and definitely I've had to check their work. And if I don't, all of a sudden I find all these really weird things that don't belong there. <laughs> it's like, Hey guys, come on. So that's a, that's a good life lesson. Um, so now here's a question that I've been asking more recently of people. Obviously, it's, it's very topical. Um, has COVID affected what you do uh, in any meaningful way? Does it mean you just get to work from home more? Uh, are you in the office as much as normal? Um, were you ever needed to be in the office? Did you work from home before COVID hit? Uh, how does it affect what you do uh, in particular? Well, I would like, I mean, my biggest joke is my top half does not match my bottom half. So <laughs> I will not tell you what the bottom half has. That has been the biggest joke, but so we were here. Pa often. Pants are just a suggestion, like speed limits, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm like the weatherman, you know? <laughs> um, so before COVID, we were working from the office and I, I, I didn't really work from home. I mean, my daughter was going to, you know, it was just kind of, it was easier to go into the office and get, everybody was there to yeah. get everything done. And so as soon as COVID hit, we are still working from home. Um, and by some saving grace, the dogs, I have four dogs. They have not interrupted us. They are, they are actually sleeping. So I don't know how, what drug they were given last night, but, um, <laughs> but so the work hasn't changed. Interestingly. I mean, at first, you know, in March when COVID first started and we all were working from home, there was like this real concern of, you know, a lot of my plant sponsors were trying to figure out, like we were crazy busy, you know, how are we going to figure out this work from home process? How do we you know, deal with these benefit plans or we're going to have to freeze our benefit plans. Like we don't know what the economy is going to look like. So there was a huge flurry of work as to what are we going to do? And then COVID started hitting employees. So one of my uh, plan sponsors, because I also deal in the health and welfare arena, 
well, shoot, now what are we going to do? Are we going to require people to have their temperature? To, can we even do that? So there was all these like health and welfare questions that came up. Um, so my work really hasn't changed and my interactions haven't really changed with my clients because we do a lot of Zoom. We do a lot of telephone calls. I don't get a chance to obviously see them. Right. Um, but I do feel like we've been able to maintain the relationship and, you know, be able to, to keep, to keep in touch and, and get the work going. And, um, and so we're very grateful that, you know, and, and interestingly, a lot of my plant sponsors did very well, which is crazy to say within the pandemic, but um, they were in certain areas and in industries that were able to profit and, you know, off of some of the, the COVID um, and the pandemic, um, you know, things. So, so they did very well. So we've been very, very fortunate and thankful that the work has continued. Our plant sponsors are still in business yeah, um, and, you know, able to afford our rates. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair as well. So yeah, I guess I guess COVID really would have hit you in a unique way because it it directly affects your clients and the way that you relate to your clients and, and all of the benefits and the plans and everything else that you have to help them maintain. So that is kind of an interesting corollary to this. Whereas a lot of I've, I've talked to multiple attorneys in multiple practices, and it's just kind of neat to see, you know, some of them like, oh, I love the idea that I can zoom into, you know, client meetings and zoom in. I had a I talked to a a, a family law guy out in California. And I guess you're, in, I think you're in California too, aren't you? Yeah, I'm in California. Okay, that's right. Yeah. Um, and he, uh, he's like, you know, I, we used to just work just in the one area. I think he's in, I think he's in Los Angeles. And he says, but now we, we see people from San Diego, San Francisco, uh, et cetera, because I, all of a sudden I'm not limited in the scope that I was, but then I talked to somebody else and we were talking about, you know, how you store your documents and things like that. And he's like, well, we're just moving towards digitization, di digital, digitalization, <laughs> can't talk today, uh, and everything else. But then of course, course you're hit in a, in a way that's unique from either of those obviously you have tons of documents i'm sure that are probably going to be moved into the cloud in the near future uh to to accommodate just how everything is moving but of course your 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 plan your sponsor your the people you work for your clients are very uniquely affected in ways that are outside of the legal field itself so that's interesting um yeah. Anyway. Um, so here in a minute, I want to get into the real meat and potatoes of our discussion. We're going to talk about being kind <laughs> in a sense. Um, but first I'm going to jump over and talk about our second sponsor. Uh, so we're just going to jump over here really quickly. Um, and we're going to talk about Rocket SEO from hundreds of customers, which again is playing in my ear. There we go. <laughs> um, are you a business owner who knows that being on page one of Google is important, but you're afraid to work with an SEO company because you know that SEO is expensive and slow? Well, not anymore. Rocket SEO from hundreds of customers forces you to page one of Google safely and legally through the power of the news media. National media campaigns that rank instantly boost your website's ranking in Google and have you appearing on page one of Google in one week or less with a simple system that leverages the power of existing major media brands, your ABCs, NBCs, CBSs, and Foxes, as well as all of their networks across the United States uh, to put you on page one of Google in under a week. If you're interested, please visit hundredsofcustomers.com slash rocket to learn more or to schedule a time to talk that's hundreds of customers.com slash rocket and that is the rocket seo from hundreds of customers all righty jump back over here so i was looking uh at your bio and one of the things i read at the end uh talked about kind or kids in need of defense uh and it looks like you provide uh, pro bono free representation for children who enter the united states and who have been persecuted in their home countries. So tell me, how did you get into that? What motivates you to do that? I mean, obviously helping children is helping children to be sure, but just you know, tell, tell our listeners about this whole system and what you do. So um, what I do basically, so I got into it because I was the um, kind of liaison for our LA office pro bono um, group. And so I had looked through all the different opportunities and I'll be perfectly honest, up until maybe a couple of years ago, I hadn't done a whole lot of pro bono work. I just didn't really see that I had the time per se. Um, mm -hmm. But when we got these offers from kind or not offers, but requests for assistance and I was reading into them, I was like, okay, this is something that I'm very passionate about. So these are children who are coming over from, you know, mo right now I'm dealing mostly with children who have crossed the border in Mexico. Um, and it was all during the Trump administration. And so they came alone um, and they were brought into facilities and some of them were, you know, flown to other states. Um, and, and so the case that I have right now involves a um, sister and brother 
Um, they are, I think they were eight and 10 at the time. Um, their mother brought, you know, had them come over from um, Guatemala. They crossed across the Mexico border with a family member, but alone. The family member stayed in Mexico. They just brought them that far. The two children do not speak English. Um, they literally crossed a hole in a fence and they were picked up by border patrol. They were separated. Um, they were flown to New York and they lived kind of in these housings, um, totally separate, never had a chance to see each other. And they lived there for about six months until somebody finally contacted um, somehow the mother. And so what we're doing, and so they were living in a very um, dangerous part of Guatemala um, and there was threats against the lives of the children as well as um, the individual that they were living with. Their father was not in the picture. Um, so there was no ability to send them back home. Mm -hmm. um, so there's something called the special, it's called SIGIS. It's the special immigrant juvenile status. And it's a special visa that children can apply for when they're suffering you know, such hardship and danger in their home country. And they've been abandoned by one or both of the parents. Um, so what we did was we petitioned the, you, you first file through the state family court, or in some cases, the probate court to get this particular status, this um, SIGIS status, and then you go before immigration um, and they're already in proceedings and, you know, you can apply for the visa and then permanent resident status um, once, once it's been completed. So in this situation, we were very fortunate, the facts, um, you know, we were able to get the status and now we're waiting before immigration. Um, but we had a little kind of a, a problem in the middle of COVID because immigration, for some reason, had reopened one of the cases of the younger boy. Um, and trying to deal with that in immigration, where no offices are open, the lines are current, you know, they're always busy, and trying not to freak out the poor mother who had received a notice saying her, the case for the boy had been reopened. And it was just a misunderstanding. Like it's, it seems like documents just got passed in the mail, but... And, and they don't speak English, you know, so they don't under, all they know is that they get this letter from immigration and um, it's terrifying. And it's just, it's just been such, you know, an amazing process to be able to kind of help out this family and really give these kids, I mean, and they're, and they're beautiful, brilliant, sweet kids and kind of give them this whole new opportunity and world um, you know, knowing what they've gone through and, and just the hardships and the horror stories, you know, I know all of us have children and even to think for a second, I mean, gosh, I won't even let my daughter walk down the street alone, but to think that these children by themselves cross the border into a foreign country, not understanding, you know, the language is just, uh, it's heart wrenching to hear what they've gone through and, and you can see it on their faces and, and they're so scared and, um, so this has really kind of been my passion and I, you know, intend to do it. I help out with other cases. Um, like I said, I'm bilingual. So a lot of the yeah. you know, yeah. discussions and a lot of the documents have to be, um, in their language, which is Spanish. So it's just, you know, being there to, to help them and, and encourage them to continue with the process, to not give up because it is very discouraging. Um, and a lot of them may just decide to walk away. I mean, when you're in immigration court, you hear the cases with nobody appearing after, you know, and so a lot of people have just given up um, mm -hmm. because they don't understand the process. So, so yeah. it's a huge yeah. passion of mine. Well, I'm even, even knowing the native language in a country, sometimes the, the legal process is so confusing and convoluted. So I can imagine being somewhere where your, your native language is not the native language could make it even more difficult. So I want to ask a couple more questions about this because I'm kind of intrigued by it, just how it all is going. Um, so first off, so, and you don't have to give me any more details than are necessary um, for the sake of whatever legal ramifications there are protecting minors. Um, but so these children came in from Guatemala, went through Mexico, came into the United States, and then were picked up and went to New York. How do you in California wind up connected to these kids in New York? Is it just a random distributed caseload? Um, and so do you talk directly with these children and with the parent, the, the mother um, who is still there? Um, do you work mostly just behind the scenes, prepping documents, translating them into the languages that need to be translated. Like, so what exactly does, do you do in all of this? So when they get processed um, in, so when they were processed in New York and the mother, so the mother is actually here in the United okay. States, the mother had come over first. Um, so when they release the children to the mother, the mother is undocumented. Um, so when they released the, the children to the mother, 
um, they had given her a huge packet of, you know, here's all these different services that you can use and here's clinics and organizations that can help you with the process. Um, and so KIND was one of those organizations that was listed. And so she had contacted KIND um, since she was living here in Los Angeles to help her children. Um, and so KIND had us and, you know, so what they do is they'll give us like a case summary saying, okay, we have these five cases that we need assistance with. What can you handle? Um, gotcha. so in this situation, we took about three different cases. And so I personally took on um, the brother and sister and I said, okay, I can take those too. And so they, they hand it over to you and then you've got to get running. So, um, I mean, I totally underestimated how much work it would be. Um, I mean, I would have to say, I mean, I spent hundreds of hours on it just because navigating the state court requirements, the immigration court, you have to get, you know, registered and all these, I mean, I'd never been in a courtroom, I, you know, so put that all aside. Um, you know, there was all these other kind of logistics that you have to get through. Um, and then, yeah, so we would, we had to meet with the mother and the children to understand their story, to be able to put their story in writing and then be able to also then translate it back to them to make sure that everything that we're saying is everything that they were saying. So, um, and then we, we take the, the filings from there and, um, you know, so it's, it's definitely a very intensive project. We had to meet with them many times. Um, and when you're dealing with an eight-year-old and it has to be from the eight-year-old, it can't be the mother telling us what he endured. You know, it has to really be his words because the judge can ask him, you know, is this so, and an eight-year-old, a lot of times, you know, some of it was really hard. And yeah. so, you know, they don't want to talk about it. And so you have to really be sensitive to making them understand that you have to hear enough of what happened so that you can make the filing and the pleading convince, you know, convincing for the judge to grant the status. But at the same time, you don't want to re-traumatize them yeah. um, or ever insinuate that they're not telling the truth. It's a very fine line you have to walk, you know, walk on. And, and, and so it's... Um, you know, and just, you know, with the, the girl was, was the older sister. And when she arrived in the detention center, they did a full workup on her. Like they did a full medical exam. They gave mm -hmm. them immunizations. And I mean, I just can't imagine that, you know, this 10 year old girl who doesn't speak English had a full exam without her mother, had immunizations yeah. without, you know, any sort of, you know, family member there. So they're hard. I mean, especially little girl, she was a little bit hard. She didn't want to talk to me. She didn't want to tell me details. She's she didn't trust me for a second and I get it. I don't blame her, you mm -hmm. know, and to convince her that I was there to help her and not to, you know, do anything else was, was hard, but, um, you know, we've been working together for over a year and a half. And I think finally, you know, she cracks a smile when she sees me and, uh, <laughs> you know, that's, that's, that's the best I can hope for. And, uh, so, you know, well, that, that smile is probably of almost infinite worth. Absolutely. It's, it's, you know, the little boy, I, when we went to court last time, it was so sweet. He took my purse and he wanted me to come sit next to him versus the first time that I met him. He couldn't even look at me. He had no idea what this lady, he was genuinely scared of who I was and what I, what I was going to do. So to have had that kind of bond and to be able to help them is just, um, you know, that, that to me is everything that I've done over the past 15 years is that's worth it all. Hmm. That's interesting. That's really, that's crazy. So how many, is this the, the main case that you worked on with kind, or do you see like a certain number on a daily, monthly, weekly, yearly basis? Or I know you said um, you only started working with them pretty recently. Yeah. So that's the case that I am a hundred percent in charge of. I am assisting with an asylum case. Um, a young boy, you know, what he, he lived in. And uh, interestingly, it's, it's El Salvador. Um, he had a family ranch and his grandmother was killed, shot in front of him by some neighbors who wanted the land. Mm. And they also killed his uncle. Um, so he escaped and he actually traveled through Guatemala and then took the train across Mexico, um, the infamous train to get to the border and, and then was able to come here, cross the border here to the United States. Um, and so he actually interestingly has two avenues. He has the Sigis um, ability, application ability uh, status, but he also has a case for asylum um, based on the violence that was perpetrated against his grandmother, mm -hmm. but also it was against him, which is why he fled. 
Um, and there was newspaper articles about the incident. So there was enough basis. What was interesting with him though, was he was right at the cusp of turning 18. And when the Trump administration started issuing these new regulations and laws about who could and who couldn't get asylum and the age you know, cuts. And then also there was the rule about, well, if you traveled through another country, you might not be eligible for asylum because why didn't you stay in that other country? I was gonna ask um, you that question. Yeah, so so there was some, you know, so it was that was a very interesting case because the facts there, the law was, you know, moving and the facts, you know, were the facts. And so, you know, we didn't that that case just ended up being, I don't even have the words to describe it. Um, it ultimately ended. Um, we did apply, he did get the granted SIGI status. We are still about a year and a half later, we are still pending on the asylum case. Um, because of some of the changes in just the backlog in immigration court. Um, and, you know, the boy came here by himself and has gone through a lot. And he came to the United States and he kind of saw this world open up to him. So mm -hmm. he's also run into some legal difficulties here, which has kind of also put us like, for example, he was charged with driving without a license, mm -hmm. which not a lot of us would think that's a huge deal. But for somebody who is, has a pending status, that is actually a very big deal. Yeah. Um, and, you know, not only is the fine for that monstrous, it's over a thousand, I think it was like over, a, it's over a thousand dollars, but the failure to appear, um, the failure to pay, what that can do um, to the actual status under, you know, the guidelines is it, it can actually really affect his status. So that is a case where you, you know, we thought that was going to be the easier case because the facts just perfectly just laid itself out into an yeah. asylum case. But because of all the difference in the change of the Trump administration rules and um, just what happened when he got here and some of his actions when he got here, it actually has turned into a monster case, <laughs> um, you know, and, you know, and then you also have to deal with the fact that the family members think that, you know, well, if you're getting him, he's getting all this free legal help, you yeah. know, oh, help, you know, and it's heartbreaking to have to tell the uncle who's, you know, petitioning him that no, you might, we can't, you know, we can only work under this organization. So there's, it's a lot, it's a lot, but it is worth every second of it. That's awesome. That's just a fascinating uh, area of the law and, and the ability, the ability to, to give of your time and, and to make a difference in those people's lives is, uh, is amazing. So on behalf of all of those people, you know, I'll thank you. And I don't, you know, I try to keep this podcast generally non-political. I know that there were some decisions of the Trump administration that probably made things more difficult. I've, I've been told that there's some decisions of the Biden administration that are making things more difficult too, or at least increasing numbers. I don't know what the best case scenario is, but I'm glad that there are people out there like you that are working to help these people uh, in, you know, whatever way you can to, to better themselves. And uh, I still take heart in the fact that all these people want to come to the United States. I love our country. I've always loved our country. I still love our country. And uh, I, I hope that uh, you are successful in allowing them to uh, to hopefully, you know, matriculate, become become members of, of our and maybe even citizens one day uh, of this lovely country. So, um, well, Heather, I uh, I would like to keep talking to you about this stuff for another half hour at least. Um, but I do have uh, an obligation coming up and I don't want to take up a ton of your time as well. Um, so we'll probably wrap things up here. Before we do that, though, uh, are there any uh, parting words of wisdom or anything that you'd like to share with our uh, with our listeners uh, about either facet of what you do, uh, the pro bono work or just the uh, the the beautiful, sexy Arissa stuff? Yeah, I, I don't know if I could touch on that. Um, <laughs> I think it's just, you know, there's in, in any law field, there's going to be moments of burnout and there's going to be moments of I don't want to do this anymore. Mm -hmm. And I think you have two choices. You either find something within that area of law that you really enjoy, whether it be speaking or doing pro bono work or helping younger generations, you know, grow, find that. Or in a worst case scenario, take a time out, you know, um, you know, take, take some time for yourself to figure out, you know, what it is that you enjoy out of life, because there's a lot that we can all give back as lawyers. And there's a lot that we can do for, you know, communities there that are not necessarily as privileged as we are. And so never take for granted what it is that we're able to do. And, you know, like I said, find a way to give back, find a way to make yourself whole in this process. Um, because at the end of the day, that's to me what it's all worth. You know, my law degree means that I can help people and I can do it in a variety of ways. And, and in some ways I do it 
to, you know, keep my house and make a living. But in other ways, I know it's important for me to help others. Um, so that's the balance that I found. So. Gotcha. And if any of our listeners are interested in talking with Heather, uh, what's the best place for them to reach you? Um, feel free. Um, you can uh, email me, heather.abrigo at fagre, F-A-E-G-R-E, drinker.com, or just you can Google Heather B. Abrigo and you'll find my contact information. Um, and yeah, that's probably the easiest way. Alrighty. And down below this video and this podcast, we'll have links to uh, probably your contact page on the on the Fagri, Fagri Drinker uh, website. Um, if you'd like, I can include the email. We can, we'll leave the email off so you don't get a bunch of spam probably. Uh, but people can find you that way. We'll have a link to the website and everything else. Um, well, that's about all I got for right now. So I just want to say one more time, Heather, thank you so much for taking the time to meet with me today. Uh, I really enjoyed learning about what you do. And uh, I really, again, want to thank you for the, the pro bono work that you do, uh, helping people. I think that's just one of the best things a human being can do in general is to, to help somebody else uh, freely. So that's awesome. Uh, to everyone else listening, this is Justin West, and you've been listening to The Attorney Post. I've been talking with uh, Heather Abrigo of Fagre Drinker, and uh, she does some great work. So look her up online as well. Look up her company, especially if you need some ERISA work <laughs> and you live uh, out on the, uh, on the West Coast. Uh, that being the case, I'm going to go ahead and sign off here. But Heather, thanks again for being with us. And to everyone else, keep listening, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>